Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another Land Effects webinar. My name is JR, and I work in the client success and manufacturer connection departments here at Land Effects. We have a very special guest for you today. Today's guest webinar is presented by Hannah Conover. Hannah is currently a junior here at Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo. Hannah is here to talk to you today about how geographic information systems uh, can potentially be vital companion to CAD in the irrigation design process. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, the webinar is being recorded, which will be uploaded early next week if you'd like to fall back on it. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A button down at the bottom there. We'd be happy to pass those along to Hannah. Today, we have Mike Bennett, our tech support manager, and myself moderating. As always, the chat box is there and is a great place for any comments, banter, or to chat amongst yourselves. Lastly, if you're viewing this in full screen and want to exit out, if you head toward the top, you should see an exit full screen or escape option. With all that said, I'd love to turn this over to Hannah. Hi, everybody. Um, today, I'll be reviewing uh, geospatial information systems technology, a bright future for irrigation design. Just a little about me. I'm a California Polytechnic State University student. I'm currently working with Blue Diamond as a geospatial relations intern. I have previously worked in GIS for Land IQ and Forest Service. I'm currently earning software certificate of achievement certificates in advanced software development and GIS technology. So let's get started. Uh, first, I'll discuss uh, GIS and CAD integration. Secondly, I will cover GIS's public data and how it can be used for irrigation design and its relevance to soil, especially. Thirdly, I will explain remote sensing and how it can save water and manage water use. Lastly, I will show how GIS can be used for mapping projects and its potential for or after irrigation design care. Then we'll do a Q&A. So the GIS basics, let's dive in. So GIS technology or geographic or geospatial information systems is a technology that allows the capture, storage, and manipulation analysis and presentation of geographic data. It uses hardware, software, and data to work with spatial information, which is information that has a location or geographic component. Later in the slideshow, we'll discuss how some of that data is acquired and can be used. But as you can see in the image, uh, data is visually displayed within a software system. So GIS data types can be classified into two main categories, raster and vector data. And I'll discuss that more in a bit. GIS data can also be further categorized into spatial, non-spatial attributes and metadata. So raster data is a type of geospatial data that is represented by a grid or a cell or pixels. Uh, each pixel in a raster data set contains a value that represents a particular feature or attribute of the geographic area being analyzed. Uh, G GIS raster data that you'll probably commonly see is mostly elevation data, evaporate transpiration data, uh, temperature data, and it's all layered out in a mosaic-like fashion. Uh, vector data is a type of geophysical data that represents geographic features as points, lines, and polygons. Those are some of the uh, actual features you can go into GIS software and draw yourself. These features are defined by their spatial relations to one another and can be used to analyze and understand physical characteristics of a given area. Uh, vector data you'll likely see could be rivers, uh, actual irrigation lines, uh, roads, uh, areas outlining uh, crops or buildings. And then some non-spatial data you'll see is GIS metadata. It provides essential information about geospatial data, such as the data source, data of, data of creation, accuracy, and reliability. And this can be opened up in GIS through a feature called the attribute table. And then the attribute data contains non-spatial information that contains 
describes the characteristics of spatial features in a geospatial data set. And in the attribute table itself, uh, you could have upwards, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of rows of columns that could just be a single uh, vector point or polygon that contains lots of information about what you're trying to map out. So GIS data is often displayed in maps, charts, graphs, and 3D visualizations. Interactive web maps are a popular way to display GIS data, and it allows users to explore and interact with data layers throughout a web browser. Um, and this can be this. Um, this is actually what uh, Blue Diamond does. The company I work for is all of our spatial data is organized in a web application, and you go through and click on each almond orchard polygon and see who owns it. Is it a Blue Diamond member or not? Uh, where it is, um, and it's really useful. And GIS data layers are individual data sets that contain specific types of geospatial information, such as the roads, buildings, land use, or hydrology, which can be combined to create a comprehensive GIS analysis. And the cool thing about the data layers, they can be toggled on and off. So you could compare all of your data layers or only two of them, only see one of them. Um, and this, all the data layers are actually within the APRX project itself within your GIS software. Applications, GIS has a wide range of applications in various fields, including urban planning, environmental management, transportation, emergency management, and agriculture. GIS can be also used in remote sensing to process, analyze, and visualize satellite and aerial imagery to extract valuable geospatial information and make informed decisions. So right here, you have uh, the image on the right. You can see how GIS can be used for something like crop analysis, where each one of those is a polygon, and then you have your imagery underneath and you're analyzing kind of the vegetation uh, density, water deficit, or crop stress. That's just one thing you can do. And the software availability, I mainly prefer Esri GIS software. It's a leading platform for creating, managing, analyzing, and sharing geospatial data and maps. There's also QGIS and other softwares, but Esri just stays king currently. And you have their products such as ArcGIS, ArcGIS Online, ArcGIS Pro, Map Viewer, uh, Urban Planning, etc. Right there is ArcMap. As you can see, you have all the topographic info, uh, elevation, slope, aspect. If this were to be actually open, I could toggle all that on and off. Uh, to only see certain things that I want to see. So let's discuss GIS and CAD, the differences and how they can be both integrated with each other. So data type, GIS is designed to work with geospatial data that has uh, location information. CAD focuses on graphical representations of designs and engineering projects. Uh, the spatial relationships, GIS software understands spatial relationships between features, um, distance, agent, uh, adjacency, and uh, containment. That's not a really a part of CAD too much in respects to uh, when trying to put a CAD project into the real world. Uh, analysis capabilities. JS provides tools for spatial analysis, such as buffer zones, proximity analysis, and spatial queries that aren't available in CAD. Uh, GIS can incorporate and analyze and, and analyze. Sorry, my bad. Data from a wide range of sources, including remote sensing, GPS, and survey data. And also, what's cool about GIS is you can incorporate a lot of public data. Uh, you could pull maps. Uh, from other online Esri users. CAD focuses more on data created within the software or your project itself. 
uh, output formats, GIS produces maps and visualizations that could be used for spatial analysis and decision making. Uh, CAD obviously produces detailed engineering and design drawings, but they could be integrated with each other, which is super cool. And I'll discuss more of that. So GIS and CAD are often integrated to take advantage of the strengths of both technologies. I'd say uh, GIS can provide context for CAD drawings by adding geospatial data, such as aerial imagery or terrain data while CAD could be kind of overlaid with the detailed design information of the system you're trying to build uh, that can actually be put into GIS for analysis. Irrigation layouts uh, or building footprints could be integrated into a GIS project and you can uh, overlay that information. So the integration of GIS and CAD allows for more informed decision makings and better design outcomes. And I'll go over that, why that is. So the irrigation design possibilities with GIS. So GIS public data is a geospatial, is geospatial data that is made available to the public by government agencies, nonprofit organizations, or private companies for free or at low cost. The data can be used that, and included in a wide range of geospatial information, such as maps, satellites, imagery, uh, demographic data, and environmental data. But so the US Geological Survey has thousands of re relevant geospatial data collections, including maps, satellite imagery, and environmental data that can be used for effective irrigation design. All data can be used freely without permission. Some of the useful data they have is elevation data, watershed uh, data, and imagery. So obviously, if you're an irrigation designer, elevation data is really important uh, for all the engineering calculations and design specializations. So elevation data can be downloaded through USGS and added to a GIS project. And then it could be in the form of vector or raster, especially, especially it would be in the form of actual raster data because it is elevation data. So it's critical for irrigation design for maintaining flow rates and pressures to know your elevation and how much your system could be rising or decreasing. So if you were to go make an initial design and you did it before actually conducting probably a ground survey and you wanted to get a first overall uh, what you think your uh, design will look like, uh, accessing elevation data is could be a first uh, important step to that, especially if you're doing a large scale um, irrigation design. So designers obviously can use the elevation data to make the changes to their irrigation systems to make design specs. And the way that would be done is overlaying the CAD um, irrigation design over your elevation raster data if your uh, watersheds are a concern because there is potentially a creek nearby, a lake or anything like that, and if you're using chemigation in your, in your irrigation or the plants, your landscaping do use fertilizers and as environmental laws become more strict, this is probably a very useful thing, is to uh, account for irrigation uh, runoff. So watershed data, can be downloaded and then added to the GIS project that will probably be in the form of vector data. And the watershed mapping can be used to predict possible irrigation runoff. Where are the watersheds? And then obviously you could look at your elevation raster data and be like, okay, the uh, right here we have a slope. Uh, irrigation runoff from our sprinklers could possibly go there. And then so you want to account for that in your designs to you know, try to mitigate that, obviously because it poses a natural threat to watersheds. And then obviously 
imagery is a good uh, baseline to overlay your irrigation um, design over. You're able to better visualize how your irrigation will look over like in the real world because the you could download satellite imagery from Landsat, MODIS, and Aster. The satellite imagery could be used as a base map but however, free satellite imagery is typically offered at low resolution, but it still is a good base map. Uh, higher resolution data, you usually have to go and search, uh, go through other softwares or actually have to concept, uh, contact Landsat, Modus, or Aster themselves. Um, if it is really important to you to have the most high quality base map, um, then go ahead. And then here, so an example, a good example of the data that you can pull would be this, it's um, nitrogen. And so if you know, nitrogen is harmful um, to irrigation designs. So spatial data such as nitrogen water can be inserted into GIS software as raster data and prevent and presented visually with your irrigation design. So if your irrigation design um, relies on groundwater and you know where your groundwater source is and it's buffered with in close proximity of high nitrogen output, you're gonna have to account for that in your irrigation design and obviously make the proper steps to mitigate any sort of harm so that's, that's, that's obviously some useful data that could be pulled. Another one is Google Earth. So Google Earth offers high resolution imagery for non-commercial use. Obviously, if you're designing irrigation systems, this is a commercial, that is a commercial use. So it is, it is something you'd have to pay for. Google Earth Engine is a software tool for extracting desired information from imagery. Um, that you also have to pay for, but it is very useful. So the problem is with Google Earth Engine is you have to be familiar with uh, programming language. I personally use JavaScript. I find that to be the easiest. So Google Earth Engine and landscape and landscape irrigation, utilizing Google Earth's high resolution satellite imagery and mapping tools and GIS. Urban landscaping and irrigation studies can identify areas of low water efficiency. Determ uh, this determines optimal locations for green spaces and develops and develop strategies for sustainable water use in cities. This can lead to more uh, effective urban planning and improve uh, water management practices. So within a uh, Google Earth. Uh, Google Earth Engine itself, you can extract uh, spectral uh, rate, uh, radiation data that analyzes how healthy the vegetation is. And, or you can look at high resolution imagery and see where there's optimal spaces for certain uh, plants. And then for agricultural use, Google Earth provides platforms for accessing and visualizing high resolution satellite imagery, which can be used in GIS to analyze agricultural and landscape features. Uh, you can look at crop health, land use, soil types, and terrain. Um, if you're studying irrigation in agriculture, uh, obviously, uh, analyzing crop health uh, and crops response to certain irrigation methods, especially during droughts or rainy years. Uh, GIS is going to be a great tool. This and this can assist in making informed decisions related to agricultural irrigation management and land use planning. So when I worked for Land IQ, uh, I would map, do a lot of crop mapping. And this would be turned into DWR that would use all this GIS uh, uh, data we created for uh, making uh, water related decisions and water and analyzing water management. It was a super, it was a super cool thing to be a part of.
and Google Earth image engine imagery can be dissected in GEE for spectral radiometric changes. Uh, large scale landscape and, ir and agricultural land can be analyzed to GEE for their responses to new irrigation. Um, irrigated areas that are too spotted in color may be experiencing poor uniform distribution. As you know, in irrigation engineering, having a high, high uniform distribution is really important especially for uh, e having efficient irrigation systems. And pure uni uh, uniform distribution will waste water while not supplying enough water to certain areas, obviously. So visualizing irrigation with GIS spectral analysis aids in understanding the effect of different irrigation techniques and where the system is at fault. And especially if you're an irrigation designer that has been uh, assigned to uh, designing a new irrigation because say your client doesn't like their current one or according to new environmental regulations they need to install a new one or update it. Uh, pulling up imagery like this and kind of an analyzing it from a high level can be, uh, can be really a great assistant to you. Um, because especially if you're mainly at the office, you don't wanna be continually going to the field, the field site. It re reduces traveling and you know, spending time in the hot sun if it's hot outside or rain. You never know what the weather brings. So evapotranspiration data, there's there's several sources. Uh, if you're California, California Irrigation Management Information Systems uh, is my go-to. Um, if you're outside of California, there's lots of other uh, data sites you could pull weather data from and evapotranspiration data from. One of those could be a uh, uh, federal government uh, weather sites and other places like that. Uh, so CIMIS offers important data regarding weather, precipitation, temperature, wind, ETO, and other imperative information for irrigation scheduling and design. So this data can be used to predict future irrigation scheduling based on past and average trends in weather. The weather stations are scattered throughout California, so you can pick the weather station that's closest to you. Open ET is a public platform for visualizing past and current evapotranspiration spatial values. ET can be compared with flow meter data to estimate how much water was potentially wasted or if the, the, the irrigators were under irrigating or over irrigating. Uh, open ET can also allow you to look at where you at nearby areas where you're installing or designing a new irrigation system and be like, oh, here the, the plants tend to uh, evapotranspirate a lot or they don't. Um, when you go to the site itself, you could take note of other nearby plants or landscape designs and know what plant they are and then go look at open ET and decide is that plant doing evapotranspirating a lot or it isn't and that could be that could be factored into like okay maybe I don't want that plant or maybe I do want that plant or that's a that's a good recommended plant for landscape for nearby landscaping so this is an example of a CIMIS data chart and obviously this could be copied and pasted into excel sheets and used for irrigation uh, scheduling calculations. So you have the month and the years and the ETO, the that's based off of the grass ETO, total precipitation, radiation, vapor pressure, air temperature, humidity, it goes on and on. It's, it's a really great resource. And then open ET, the what cool thing about open ET is what I did here is I actually drew my own area 
side drew area of 9.790 acres right here in Hawthorne, which is Los Angeles area. And it gave me the evapotranspiration of that area. And so if you're studying irrigation or you're um, designing a new irrigation and you wanna kind of check out their old system, a good way to do this is to draw your own uh, shape of the area you're studying and look at, okay, how much those, these uh, plants were using. And if you know how much water that irrigated, uh, ir old irrigation system was using that for that year, you can compare that with the evapotranspiration data and see, kind of compare that to like, oh, how much water did the plants use versus how much water did the irrigation, irrigation system use? Um, and it could be uh, factored in was like, okay, was this, where was this irrigation system at fault and how me as a designer uh, not make that same mistake? Soil web, it's by the USDA and it offers free downloadable and viewable soil data on soil web survey and soil web. The soil web data can be implemented into GIS for irrigation design purposes. And an AOA, uh, AOI shape file can be inserted into the website to extract desired soil information as well. Um, here, we'll take a look what soil web has to offer so this is the information available on soil web you could just click anywhere or you could go back to um, soil web survey and insert your own shape files right here but you're able to click around and you're able to see what type of soil you're dealing with uh, the drainage class everything from the water table depth to bedrock depth, sometimes it's available, sometimes it's not, but you're, all the different types of soil that's in that area, obviously it's when you click around, oops, my bad. Um, land capabilities, uh, class, you're able to see carbon stocks, wind ero erodibility, um, runoff, hydric ratings, um, total plant available water, which is a very important factor in choosing what plants you wanna plant. And so that's all the data and feel free. I highly recommend after this um, presentation to go to Soil Lab and click around, it's super cool. So soil's impact on irrigation, it, it impacts uh, the type of soil you're dealing with obviously impacts the soil workability. So it, that usually plays a big role in construction of the irrigation systems, as well as planting your plants or harvesting if you're ag. So soil that is more workable tends to need less maintenance. Obviously, you don't want soil that is super workable or sensitive because if you're dealing with uh, areas of high wind that soil can tends to kind of blow away but knowing how workable the soil is for irrigation construction can aid in effectively estimating building time slash cost available water in the soil all soils have an available water holding capacity so plants with an extensive root depth will need soil with a deeper water holding capacity as well as a soil that uh, reaches um, deeper depths. And plants with a shallow root zone do not need to be in soil with deep water uh, or high water, uh, water holding capacities. Knowing the water holding capacity aids in developing irrigation scheduling and em emitter specializations. Um, if you're dealing with a soil that obviously has a lower um, a lower water holding capacities. Uh, something like a drip irrigation system would work pretty well. Um, soils that have high available water holding capacities can be flooded because 
uh, they'll probably hold that water more than soil that can't. And then obviously drainage is a huge impact in irrigation. The soil can be drainable, otherwise water will collect and cause root rot. And soil with low drainage will need less frequent irrigation, vice versa. And all what's really cool is obviously this data will be, this data can be visualized in GIS and overlaid with your irrigation design. Obviously more runoff. And then another thing with the runoff is you can incorporate those watershed polygons and shape files. So that's an example of overlaying two different data layers that are really important with each other. So soil with high runoff and low infiltration rate will result in poor effective irrigation. Too much runoff can be damaging to surrounding watersheds environments as well. So and then erosion, soil subject to high erosion rates will lose their topsoil quicker. And the topsoil contains essential nutrients for plants. So if you're dealing with soil that has um, um, not much, that has high erosion rates, then you might need more fertilizer. And especially if you're a landscape uh, designer, you're going to have to put in um, your own soil. So the classification, knowing the types of soil and a land parcel is essential to choosing plants to irrigate and therefore decide which irrigation method to use and design. And then obviously classification also works into workability as well as uh, things like drainage. And not all plants are equal. Different plants do better in certain soils while others don't. And certain irrigation methods do better in certain soils while others won't. So soil web, great tool. And then analyzing the soil with GIS, it's there's a lot of accurate mapping and adding data, soil data to the APRX GIS project will display coordinate specific spatial soil data. And then obviously you could overlay your uh, irrigation design or your potential irrigation design. Placing a potential irrigation system over a soil layer will show how the two line up. And then estimating your compatibility, um, for example, planting plants, with extensive root zone and soil with limited water holding capacity will result in overwatering for the plant to survive. A soil with low water holding capacity will have a narrow window between too much and not enough moisture. Soil with the chances of high runoff will need more drainage engineering for decreased likelihood of flowing. And then you could predict, um, you could overlay your elevation data with your soil data and find out, uh-oh, in our landscape design, we need to put in some retaining walls. And like I said, the cool thing about this, this can be done without actually going to the site itself. Obviously though, if you are an irrigation designer, you're gonna have to go to the site yourself, but this, is, this could be used as prep work. It also reference data after you go to the site. So remote sensing integrated with GIS. So remote sensing is kind of new, kind of not. It's been there before, but it's starting to pick up and uh, more and more companies are integrating um, remote sensing, especially if you're an environmental design firm, an agricultural firm, um, but it also can be used for landscaping and irrigation, especially. So at Cal Poly, we have the Irrigation Training Research Center and um, metric data and evapotranspiration data has been a big thing. And we collect that with remote sensing. And it's pretty cool. It's actually what uh, my research project was based on last quarter. So remote sensing is the process of collecting information about an object or phenomenon without 
physical contact through the use of various sensors such as satellites, drones, or aircraft. It involves measuring and analyzing the electromagnetic radiation emitted or reflected from the target area to obtain data about its properties and features. One of the cool uh, new satellites that will be used for remote sensing that's coming out is SWOT. And then it's going to measure, I think, 95% of lakes larger than uh, a certain acreage amount. I think it's like 15,000. I might be wrong. My, my apologies if that is. And then rivers wider than uh, about 300 feet. So, and that's a pretty cool feature that will be, that could be, that will, that's cool data that will be used for analyzing the effects of climate change. It's so obviously right here in the image, you can see how um, remote sensing is done as certain spectral bands are reflected off of the object and back to the satellite. And so how it can be used, remote sensing is a cost-effective way to make design decisions without the hassle of continuously and continuously and continuously returning to the field. Remote sensing can be used to monitor the water usage of crops and vegetation by analyzing their spectral properties, such as uh, the NDVI index and patterns of water uptake. This can help in identified areas of over or under irrigation and overall irrigation efficiency. And as previously discussed before, probably my top um, my top favorite software for analyzing remote sense imagery uh, would have to be Google Earth Engine because it's really easy to use coding to pull what spectral bands you wanna look at. Especially for different certain areas, you could even uh, write in code to what um, satellite imagery you wanna pull from, whether it's Landsat 7, Landsat 8, whichever ones you feel like is most useful to you. And so merging that with CAD, the integration of GIS and CAD can be beneficial for irrigation design. Obviously, GIS can provide spatial data such as soil types, topography, and land use, while CAD can be used to create detailed irrigation system designs. This is obvious. The two systems can be integrated to enable irrigation designers to work with both spatial and design data in a single environment allowing for more accurate and efficient irrigation system designs. So you can pull all of your remote sense data, all of your public data that you have found, um, and then put over your irrigation design. And it, it, it could be a potentially really, really, really cool tool. I can't emphasize that enough. So right here, is probably a good example. So you have, say if you're agriculture, uh, this could be obviously worked with uh, landscaping as well. Your, all your data, this could be within individual layers itself, your irrigation scheme over a nice little base map. So what's going to be cool about that is any discrepancies are easily visible in the user interface, hence presenting uh, any design uh, errors you may pick up before the uh, construction begins. And so design specifications, like I said, soil data, elevation data, uh, watershed data, all important to irrigation designs. So it also, what's really cool is GIS can analyze water use. So GIS software can perform zonal raster analysis with evapotranspiration spatial data, crop coefficient uh, data, soil data, and coverage area. So this is an example of what raster data looks like. It's like this mosaic um, kind of pattern. Each of those little polygons represents uh, quick uh, data. And so a zonal raster uh, does is you actually draw out a vector polygon and then you run it through um, zonal programs within Esri software itself. And Esri 
uh, does that with the use of Python. Um, if you don't know this, Esri's uh, back, backing uh, program language is Python. And obviously what's really cool about the soft GIS software is if you know Python, you can um, go in there and make, uh, kind of design your own analysis and calculate your own things you want to do within uh, your software. So, and then obviously after you do your zonal, so uh, zonal layout, you're gonna get all of your, uh, what that area's evapotranspiration and crop coefficient or soil data. You combine that with local ETO and weather data, and you can build your water balancing irrigation schedules. Uh, that could be estimated for your landscape and agricultural needs. Uh, GAS can be used to monitor changes in water use over time, helping to identify trends and opportunities for sustainable water management. So if you're an irrigation designer and you go through and you design irrigation systems, you can, you can monitor your own irrigation systems um, to see how they're doing like this. And then obviously as you go through, um, it's going to give you powerful input for new irrigation designs that you're going to build. So you can make uh, better decisions, better sustainable water management practices. Um, yeah, so for example, I did that and found out uh, that Cal Poly uh, potentially overwatered by 308 millimeters in 2019 and 542 millimeters in 2022. I mean, not 2022, 2020. So I took their flow meter data and then um, I took my own remote sense data and I compared that. And as well, what you could do is build potential irrigation scheduling. So this is a proper irrigation scheduling that the sports complex should have used if they were um, actually regarding what um, grass they were using, the weather data and everything like that, uh, but they didn't. And so that's why they overwatered. But obviously if you're an irrigator or an irrigation designer, uh, you know how to schedule or what scheduling should be looked like. So GPS and mapping projects. So what's cool about GIS is it's, you can load your GIS projects onto mobile devices with the user's location live projected in project. And this can be done with softwares like ArcGIS field maps. And what this will help you with is you builders or uh, people on site can navigate projects easily and uh, they can kind of like note progress uh, as irrigation, uh, as the irrigation systems being constructed. And this allows uh, for them to make specific notes at certain locations where a problem might be occurring during construction. Um, and that could be live fed uh, uh, projected into the map. So office engineers can see, uh-oh, this went on with uh, during the construction and you don't have to be right there on site to know that. And it's gonna be where they noted something or pinned something, it's gonna be very coordinate specific. Um, there's also more after construction support so for farmer, farmers and landscape owners, farmers can have their own field map of their irrigation systems. So they can easily navigate the irrigation design, make coordinate specific pinpoints for damages or break in the irrigation system, can send harvesters and planters to specific locations. And they can also track harvesting, planting, slash planting progress by maps. Landscape owners can have their own generation uh, own generated irrigation schedules to avoid overwatering and underwatering, as well as the same things uh, the 
the farmers have. So if you're if if their landscape client is say it's like a big giant garden um, for a commercial building, uh, they could have their own map just the same as uh, farmers, obviously. And if they ha if they hired gardeners, um, if the gardeners need to have an ear have a plant map it's a it might be a good idea if it's a high maintenance garden or if there's any damages to irrigation system putting it on the map good idea and then for the engineers the engineers could have their phone field maps of their irrigation systems and and uh, monitor them through um obviously things like Google Earth or uh, current updated imagery. The great thing about satellite imagery, it's constantly being released and there's new and new data. So you, you can still kind of monitor how irrigation is, your irrigation system is going, how well and efficient it is, and, you know, implement that uh, knowledge into future designs. So you can recognize any mistakes in the design by exact location and easily map any damages for repairs and easy, vis easy visual organization of your path of past projects. So all in all, I really do believe GIS has a lot of potential for irrigation uh, design water management, um, uh, irrigation studying. Uh, it could be implemented with CAD or CAD could be implemented with GIS. It's more of how uh, CAD projects could be inserted into GIS projects. But I think the future really is releasing software that can do both at the same time instead of transferring projects to and shape files from one another. It's like turning your uh, CAD project into a shape file and then putting it into GIS software. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of exciting room for potential. And um, uh, GIS is something that's being quite picked up on in the water world. Um, I'd like to uh, start questions if anyone has any. Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. That was an awesome presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to go ahead and throw them into the Q&A box. Um, so Hannah, I know that almonds tend to be, you know, a little bit more, they tend to require quite a bit more water in relation to any other, any other like nut or fruit bearing trees. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure quite a few of these tools are used on a regular basis uh, over there at Blue Diamond. Have you yes. seen any of these GIS tools be used more often than um, others during your internship with Blue Diamond? I would say um, probably not. Uh, we have not used a uh, Google Earth Engine. I've uh, spoke to them about it, but Google Earth Engine is kind of more uh, used for researchers. The the and it's still not widely used because not everyone knows programming languages. That's something you would have to go learn. And not everyone wants to go learn that. Probably the one I see the most would be uh, QGIS. And what I should note about QGIS is it's not as common as the Esri products, but it's kind of easier to learn than Esri products, but there's more limiting capabilities. Uh, it's not as good as Esri products. So I see a lot of QGIS, but then I see Esri products in what is the web development or online, um, online orchard maps. So Esri software, what's cool about that is you can produce your own online maps and everyone within your organization could go access that. So everyone within Blue Diamond that has a Blue Diamond email and password could go open up the map 
and see where all the orchards are, all the data about the orchards, when it was planted, um, who owns it, is it a member or not? And that is continually updated. Super cool. So you see that being used most often. Um, yes. Okay, go ahead. Cool. Uh, so in regards to obviously like orchards being a lot of the mean here in California and prior to these, these kind of storms that we've had, um, what uh, do you see like a lot of that drought talk has, or a lot of these tools have come into that drought talk, obviously for those of us out here in the West, um, do you see that quite often? Yes. Uh, GIS is used to spatially uh, organize our uh, sigma data and analyze certain crops or and orchard parcels for water risk. So what's a cool thing we do is we map, we have all the counties mapped out and we have all our orchards in our counties mapped out. And so how it works is um, as drought, as, um, as certain counties make water restrictions, um, they release that. And what happens is a lot of the almond, our almond growers are cut off and we're able to project map that, we're able to map out that data visually and analyze trends and what counties do almond orchards get cut off the most. And what that uh, plays a role into is um, future decisions uh, where we want to target um, for recruiting new growers. Obviously, if there's high water risk in that area, uh, then we wouldn't want to go um, uh, recruit more growers. Oh, there's a question. Can yeah, for sure. So um, the question just for everyone, um, out there it's uh can you give instances of why it might be better to use data from google earth engine versus other sources such as the state city or uh, county data so google earth engine it's data that um so what the, it really is is it's all your it's all sorts of satellite imagery and you would have to actually um know how to code and extract that imagery yourself. So pulling NV, uh, different, uh, resol uh, different resolution data and then different uh, spectral data to pull out uh, plant health. Um, state, city, county data, uh, all that work is done for you. So if the state has data about water or the city does or the county does, the, the work is already done for you. But what Google Earth Engine is good for is if that you can't find that data, you extract it yourself. Super cool, thank you for that. Um, one other question, uh, so you kind of mentioned free data, but also of course the ESRI GIS products. For an irrigation designer wanting to access this data, say for a particular job, is it necessary to get a license and learn the software or are there service, service bureaus that uh, could be hired to generate a report for a job site? Oh, yes. Uh, so you could either go through and get the software license yourself or you could uh, go through an environmental firm such as Land IQ, and I, there's got to be several others. Um, I know there's several others that do environmental um, mapping and all the GIS software stuff for you. Awesome. Thank you for that. Well, it looks like that is all of the questions that we have for today. Hannah, again, we truly appreciate you know the wonderful presentation. There was a lot of information that um, I think generally we we don't get to see on the irrigation side. So it was really cool that you were able to present that. Um, mm -hmm. For everyone that joined us today, thank you all so much. We hope that everyone has a um, great weekend and we'll see you all back here in April to go over uh, Revit for planting design. Thanks everyone.
Thank you.